Hi, good afternoon and welcome to another Q&A session with Steve Etches. So we've got some questions from Facebook. So first question is from Ellie McQuiston and she asks, Hi all at the Etches. I know I've already asked before when I was last in, but will you do classes in-house for preparation of fossils that customers find? I know you were saying the logistics were a bit of a nightmare, but I think if you actually did say a five day long course with very small groups, perhaps that may work. So what are your thoughts on fossil It's prep? okay, but unfortunately we're governed by this thing called health and safety. Yeah. And I'm not sure if it would, this workshop would meet those requirements for to tick in the box. So I honestly, I really don't know. And we, we can do it, talking about it, but demonstrating yeah. where you're getting people in. And we've only got one machine at the time. So yeah, if you even got five people, people it's a bit, it? little bit difficult. Yeah, but we funny. can actually demonstrate that without people being present yeah. and Ash could do that. Well, that's, that that's what I was thinking perhaps. But, and I mean, maybe maybe our, yeah. our followers but, um, could let us know what they think about this. Mm. Maybe we could actually record classes if you yeah but classes, but also as like Ash just pointed to that we got the, the television the screen there and if we did a live link yeah. to that which is what I was hoped to in the first place yeah, here live stream so that people can working. see me prepping this material yeah. and the other thing that we could do is we could overlay that with um with your with, with you speaking so right. you're actually giving instruction as to what it is you're doing the tools that you're using um, the, the cleaning, the abrasive cleaning mm. powder that you're using, mm. why you use it. Because the other thing as well to bear in mind is it all depends on the type of fossil that you're, you're prepping, but also where it's from and what the matrix is as well. So what it's... What well, most air pens can deal with hard, very hard matrix. If you're doing something specialist, something that's really delicate, you can still use these things, but you'd, you'd be advised to clean it under a microscope. Yeah. Um, because the prep, it's not just about the prep of the fossils, it's also the conservation of it as well. As we were talking in another of our Q&A sessions about how to, you know, how to preserve and look after the, these fossils, because some of them can deteriorate over time. So it's also preserving them going forward. And Oh, there's a whole realm of sort of things you can do. But the first thing is, if you're going down that road and we're talking about prepping and everything else, the first thing you do is... Actually, the fossil you find is recorded exactly what level and where it came from. See, that's, that's really the first thing, isn't it? So, when you find a fossil, what data do you record of your? your well, it's quite simple, really. Is the number of this, there's a catalogue number for the specimen, yeah. which is impre impressed onto the sort of fossil itself, so you can work that which one it represents. Um, locality, horizon, yeah. what the specimen is, what you think it is, and the data is collected. That's quite simple, really. You can go a bit further if you want to, but that's for me, that's enough. Yeah. And mine was very, very simple. You see all these um, numbers on fossil specimen, H996 stroke, whatever. Well, mine started off K for Kimridge. Kim and it started off at one. Yeah. We're up to now nearly 3,000. So yeah, we are, quite simple. We? And the other, the other um, interesting fact to note is every single one of our fossil records is actually accessible through our online fossil database. So if you go to our website, um, and if you go to um, one of the tabs on the website, I think it's our about um, section. If you drop down on there, you will find our online database collection and you can click through and go and have a look at some of our fossil records. But to be brutally frank, some of those images are still not on the database. No, we've still so got images go. to update yeah. for our fossil database and um, that's, yeah, it that's needs updating. It needs actually some of the specimens yeah. are not quite right in just the angle to, they've been. We need to refine it, don't yeah, we? Just yeah. a little. But bit. most of the, the, the they're on database on the you know photographic file. Yeah. Okay, but um, you know we could go on and on about this actually. Well, you have. With no, oh, sorry. what I'm saying is <laughs> we can do, <laughs> we'll be able to. I think it will be prudent to to revisit this actually and talk more in depth and create and create some, you know, something even... We could talk our, a day about this, Carla, Yeah, but we, but could, we, create, we could create something through our subscriber service that drills down into even more detail about how to well, the conserve, nice thing curate... Yeah, but creators. the nice thing is better than that is, is if you're serious about doing this, yeah. people are interested, we've got a hall there, 
let's all get together and discuss it. Yeah. Absolutely. Rather than do it on the thing, we can demonstrate things, we can go to specimens yeah. and people can ask questions there. They yeah, feel a bit, little bit more relaxed in a group. Maybe we could, yeah, maybe in, in this, I mean, following up on what, what Ellie says here is, it, rather than an intensive course where we're actually in here using equipment, maybe we could open it up as an actual um, talk from you mm. and then everybody can come along with their own quiz well, we, questions that we can talk about in in general yeah we can do t all talks about all sorts yeah. of things you know collecting localities everything else rules and goodness knows what but yeah, yeah there's a lot to be talked about but yeah, yeah. so if any of you think that. that there is anything specific that you would like to hear steve talk about in more detail then let, let us know so max hawthorne asks Steve, good old Max. Good old Max. Would you be able to ID um, the a, a pliosaur species based on three related cervical centra plus appropriate data? Up to a point, yes. Um, we have not got those images, so you better get back to Max. Yes, Max. To send these send images so me. I can look at them. Send them to me at info at the etches collection. Dot org, and then I can get Steve to have a look, and we can definitely revisit this question yeah. and answer. And answer the other thing line. is with with Max is the basic. I know he's because he's a whiz on pliosaurs. That's his main interest. It is is the fact that um, everyone accepts that Kimmeridge and pliosaur teeth are all trihedral, and they're not. So we get round ones as well, which in the base of the Kimmeridge clay we get those. And the, even the trihedral teeth, some of them have got sharp crean in, others are cutting edges, they're very, very sharply defined, and some of them are really rounded. So there, are, there is a subtle difference to these things. Wow. Now, and with the cervical vertebrae, there are some differences between a couple of the pliosaurs. Now, pliosaurs have, you know, they keep reclassifying these things. There were different species based on their mandible size and, and number of tooth in the symphysis and all sorts of things this really needs clearing up because it's still not no. been resolved fully um Kimmeridge and pliosaur lineage oh, that's interesting so you know you talked about the different teeth are you able to also would you be able to identify different pliosaur species based upon their teeth as well if we could redefine what those teeth represented in species that's yeah that's where the difficulty yeah. was. no and there's still some there's not many people in this country that work on pliosaurs um, there was Leslie Noe, who's in Colombia now. Okay. A bit of a long way to take your plants or two to show yes, him. Yes, it is. Um, and there's not many. Um, people who sort of work in vertebrate paleontology drift off into other things. So there's no one I can think of at the moment who's a whiz on um, pliosaurs. Okay, oh, interesting. Um, third question from Finley, age seven. And Finley asks, Hi, Steve. Have you found any good fossils re recently? If so, what were they? And you have had some interesting finds yeah, a few. recently, haven't um, you? Well, we've had, oh, what have we had? I'm trying to think now, fish, a few fish. Yep. Three or four fish in the season. Um, one of the most remarkable things are these little micro crinoids. So we've, oh, yeah, we've found those and perfected the technique to clean them and showing the detail what you wouldn't otherwise get. And that's quite exciting because it's showing all the sort of the column the, the, sort of the stem of the thing with these branches sort of coming off in big curls at the end and we've got the heads of these things as well and so that's been good what else have we found i can't think um oh big big ammonite lovely um, pavlovian ammonite yeah. um body chamber with all the smaller ammonites in there and the fragma cone so that's on now on display oh i saw yeah, that that's yeah, out there in yeah, the yeah. cabinet so that's, um, a new, that's a new one in, on display that if you had if you um you're coming to the museum will reopen is, is, is new but element. conditions these the last couple of three years have not been that great for collecting from my perspective because we're not had sustained dynamic conditions like storms that go on for for days and days and it's been pretty our summer our summers are very sort of hot nothing happening no sort of you know don't you find in the summer season you have a problem with the um, a weed growth yeah up? no no it is and and the problem with with people lying all over the place so you can't sort of Look where they're lying. Um, no, it's it's not good. Winter time's a lot better, but as I say, it's not been that good for collecting. Oh. And I think along the Lyme Regis again, it, it, it's sporadic, but it, it, generally it's not been that great. There's a lot of shingle over the beach, and everything's covered up. Oh, well, times may change. Oh, it will do. Yeah. No, so, um, moving on to our Instagram question. So, um, forgotten fossils asks. 
What was your first fossil discovery that you will always remember? So not your first ever discovery, but the one that is, is most momentous perhaps to you. Oh. Well, the first one really that was momentous that led on to other things was the first insect remains, the dragonfly wing. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. Because that, that was found in 1987 and that led on to other discoveries like uh, ammonite eggs. Wow, okay. And that's on display in our museum gallery, yeah, not, dragonfly wing. You can see that. When so you the eggs. Come visit. Yeah, and the eggs yeah. as well. Um, second question from um, Fossil A Diary, and they ask, what was the most challenging prep job that you've had? So which particular fossil have you found most challenging when it comes Ooh. to prepping it? Also collecting as well. So let's get okay. with the collect. This refers to the same specimen, collecting. This was collected from, we don't normally collect out of a cliff, no. but this time we did. We did a very quick health and safety risk assessment. We won't tell you based on what, but anyhow, okay. we did. And cut out of this sheer cliff, actually a big, huge, great slab, which we knew had bones in it, and it had this big bulge in it, which didn't look much until we sort of cut around it and noticed there's some teeth with it. Oh, wow. Got it back to the lab and workshop and found out that there was a series of ribs, crocodile ribs, vertebra, and a skull. And interestingly, it's taken me ages just to prep it. So in other words, it died on its back, so it was mm -hmm. upside down, and all the teeth were still in its jaw, a lot of yeah. the teeth, so you had to be careful not to break those off. And mm -hmm. bearing in mind all the shell was extremely hard, it was an oil shell. So that took a long, long time. And then it was stuck to this big block. Now, if anyone collects at Cambridge, this was solid um, well, mesoliferous pyrite. So it's just like steel. Oh, is this the, yeah, is this the yeah. one that you were cleaning and yeah. the, the smell is just... Oh, the hideous. smell is, yeah, but it's not that. It's extremely hard. Yeah. You can't use an air pen on it. It's too hard. And basically the bone underneath is, is softer than the matrix. So this wow. took a long, long time. The, um, the most foul job going, um, <laughs> using diamond grinders and an air brace of using aluminium oxide, but just enough just to take that covering of that metalliferous pirate off and it took months and months and months And to have do. you completed it? What stage are you at with it now? It was done, but we need to make a stand now because it's, the, it's a metarinca crocodile skull, it's completely new. But we need to display it, it's not on display. So it, it, are we hoping that we're going to get this out in the museum? If someone exhibition? would care to donate another £7,000 for a cabinet, we'll put it out on display. There we go. Or, would, you or, like to, would you like to sponsor us? For a cabinet and help us help we us need get two that more. crocodile we need two more. skull out. That would be amazing. Yeah. Let us know, please. Brilliant. So, third question, which is from Danuak455. And they say, what did crocodiles do so right to make it through millions of years? And they said tortoises too, although you probably might mean turtles. Through the extinction event, yeah. you mean. Well, I mean, there's a lot of thoughts on this and things died out and like everyone thinks ichthyosaurs died out during that you know comet strike or whatever it was yeah. but they're not they would die out before then i think sharks as well because all of well lots three of, other of those things. are yeah, still alive lots and lots of animals came through but of course living in water you sort of the environment doesn't change so sort of quickly i mean the oceans don't cool down that quickly or heat up that quickly so no. perhaps that was the reason they sort of came through um Turtles did as well. There's lots of other things that came through, but I'm not an expert on extinction events and everything else. So, no. um, Because we don't know, I guess, whether or not the fact that a lot of these creatures survived because of evolution or because of the great extinction, or I, I, I guess this is, this is what scientists is The question I can't answer, yeah. really. There's a lot of theories on it, and you hear all these theories. A lot of the theories are completely different, but they're all acceptable. So you, you pay your money and takes your choice. That's it. Because, I mean, I guess thinking about crocodiles and sharks, they are like the ultimate predators, and they've hardly had to change over those millions of years because they're so well adapted for what they do. Yeah, we're just in the middle of another extinction event with sharks. Yeah, this is true. There's not Humans. Many left. Yeah. Right. I think that, that, yeah, that's, <coughs> another, that's another story, isn't it? Yeah. That's very sad. Anyway, we have a fourth question from um, Phil. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that. <laughs> so what are the best places for fossil hunting in the Midlands? Is there anywhere you can? 
I haven't got a clue. Right. I would have thought it would be quarry sites. Yeah. Uh, midlands in the middle of the, yeah. So it'd be mainly quarry sites. And of course, if you go into these quarries, you need permission. Yeah. You need to pass all their sort yeah. of health and safety things. They'll, they'll do an induction course if you're lucky enough. But the trouble is again with health and safety now, what it's done is precluded all these site visits that most people are allowed to do yeah. because they don't want the risk because of course, if public fall over or something, they're gonna sue someone for their own irresponsibility. Yeah. I do have an answer to that question as well. Um, we recently had a fab restock for our online shop and we've just brought in some um, amazing geological and paleontological books. One of those is a guide to collecting fossils in the UK. So maybe it might be worth grabbing a copy of that from our online shop because you might find the answer yeah, to that in there. It's well. got all the classic sites. It has. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's a fab guide. Okay, last question is from Etch Fossils. And they ask, what is your favourite type of Jurassic ammonite? Now, you kind of mentioned this earlier because you said that the new one that we've put out of the museum, that Pavlovia, is really okay, quite Okay, well, special, for the Kimmeridge clay, most, if you come down to Kimmeridge, you'll find that most of the ammonites are crushed. Yeah. Okay, and most people don't collect them because they're quite friable, difficult to collect and difficult to sort of keep unless yeah. you keep them in the right environment. Um, Pavlovids, like Pavlovias, ammonites they're 3d they occur in nodules so yeah. often they come out they're really nice because they've got the white the residue of the shell which is like a dusty white powder on them and actually if you clean that off if you want to do it it'd be really artistic you've got the black mudstone body chamber yeah. then the fragma cone the inner bit with all the sutures is all green calcite which really does look really nice so that's probably the best ammonite that you know you can say from the kimmers clay um, not, not necessarily my favourite, but I'm not into favourite ammonites, to be honest. No, yeah. you don't have a particular favourite. Anyway, great stuff. Thank you so much for all your questions. Don't forget, keep sending them in to us and we will put them to Steve as often as we can and bring you these, um, these videos where we have an opportunity to ask ask him all the all the, the, quest, the burning questions that you have. Um, and then don't forget to let us know as well. If you would like an opportunity to perhaps, once we reopen um, and COVID's out the way, to have a session with Steve where you can meet him in person and ask away with lots of questions. Anyway, thank you very much and take care.